wow, it is so nice to be in front of live people. <laughs> it's not so nice to be wearing real pants again, but I'm so happy to see your faces. So when you're confused, um, I, can, I can catch it. This is actually my first time at Cultivate, ever. I've been in the green industry for 20 plus years. I've always wanted to come here and I'm really excited to get a chance to talk with you today. And I get to talk about one of my all time favorite topics, which is pollinators. So probably all of us here on some level realize that pollinators it's, are really directly linked to our own well-being, right? I mean, we know pollinators are important, we've, we've learned that. But what that spurred the, the topic of my talk today is that an announcement came out earlier this year from Walmart, committed to protecting pollinators. That's nice, isn't it? That's, that's a good thing. So, I have three goals that I'd like to accomplish in the short time that we have together. I'm going to introduce you to Walmart's pollinator policy. How many here have looked at the policy or read it? One. Has anybody here heard of it before? Okay. So this is going to be new information for the most of you here. Because to me, you know, somebody told me about it. I study pollinators. I talk about pollinators on the weekend to people. Like, and I didn't know about it until somebody told me. So I was like, okay, so if I don't know about it, chances are there's somebody else in here that has never heard of it either. So the first goal is just to introduce you to it if you haven't read it. The second goal is to describe the impacts that it could potentially have on the green industry. And by that I mean designers, landscapers, plant producers, everybody in that whole, the whole green industry spectrum. And last, but certainly not least, of course in my case, is to introduce you to some of my favorite pollinators and hope to help engender at least a little bit of the love for them that I have. You know, Jacques Cousteau said that we preserve that which we love, right? So if we can value pollinators, it can help us change the way that we do things, just on a very fundamental level. So I mean, these are tireless, fascinating, and exceedingly important and unpaid environmental employees that we have. Let's take advantage of that. So let's dive in. So in April of this year, Walmart announced a truly landmark pollinator health policy that is by far the most far-reaching to date of any food retailer in the US. So is Walmart gonna become some flower child? Are they going to change their logo? To a, I mean, it, it kind of looks a little bit like a flower. They might, they might spice it up a little bit. But you can decide at the end of my talk today whether Walmart is becoming a flower child. So if you've been in the industry a while, anybody here been in the industry for more than 10 years? Okay, we have some veterans. You could certainly be forgiven if you've been in the industry a while and seen these kind of pronouncements come and go if your face looks a little bit like this when you hear that Walmart has put out a pollinator protection policy. Your face might even look like this, right? Oh, wow, another policy that's, you know, is it, is it greenwashing? Is this some sort of environmental lip service so they compete more with, with Amazon's grocery delivery? Maybe. But also consider that in 2018, Walmart filed a patent for autonomous robotic bees. They're technically called pollinator drones. Now, we don't know the exact goal for Walmart's pollinator or their patent drones is for, but maybe we should ask ourselves, 
with this pollinator policy, creating a patent to create pollinator drones, do they know something that we don't know? It's a pretty big company. I'm guessing they have some insider information. And actually, this blows me away. It actually turns out that Walmart has actually been listening to scientists. I know, it's shocking, right? I'm so used to not being listened to. The glazed look that comes over people's faces most of the time when I'm in conversation, that's what I'm used to. But to have a company actually listening to the science that we've been you know, talking about for years is truly kind of a unique thing in this world. So, you know, scientists for years have been sounding the alarm about the significant de declines that we've seen and the threats to pollinators of all sorts, such as this lovely bumblebee that's covered in pollen and sitting on an echinacea blossom. So, you know, having been a scientist in, in state and federal government, it's just very strange that a company would finally start to listen. But pollinators are indeed in trouble. In fact, it's estimated that about 40% of all pollinators are at risk of extinction based on research from uh, all over the world. So let's talk about some of the main contributing factors that are leading to these pollinator declines. It's pretty much agreed across science, scientists, uh, research that one of the number one contributing factors to pollinator decline is habitat loss, degradation, and fragmentation. So, you know, that pollen and nectar that the, the bees get primarily from wild native plants is what they need to grow and reproduce. Essentially, pollinators are hungry that's the big problem. We now have agriculture that farms edge to edge. We have many of these wild hedgerows that used to support large populations of beneficial insects and pollinators are now gone to maximize yields on, on an acre. Another main contributing factor are non-native and invasive species. We're talking plants as well as non-native and invasive insects and, and diseases as well. Parasites and diseases that have come from um, colonized honeybees and, and, and hives of, of colonized bumblebees have transferred over into native populations. That's something we need to be aware of. Of course, climatic dis, uh, disturbances. We, we see now in many areas where you get a mismatch of the phenology of when flowers are blooming and when insects are able to come out and, and fertilize those flowers. So all of a sudden, they're, they're like trains missing in the night because of that mismatch due to, to climate change. And of course, last, but certainly not the primary reason, is pesticides. Although that is the one that tends to get a lot of the attention in, in the news because it's an easy it's an easy target, right? So the loss of pollinators could significantly and fundamentally change our entire food and natural ecological systems. If they're gone, things change significantly. Our grocery stores, for example, would be a lot less uh, tasty. Just in general, they'd be a lot more empty. The world would be a lot less colorful. All of these flowers that we have that bloom in the wild, if not the, just the cultivated ones, but just the ones growing in fields, require pollinators in order to survive and reproduce. So as one of the largest food supply retailers in the world, Walmart is likely concerned about what that could mean for the future of their food supply projections, right? So maybe we could call this a case of enlightened self-interest. 
Now, in and of itself, self-interest is not a bad thing, right? They need to keep producing, they need to keep paying their employees. Um, so, the nice thing about enlightened self-interest is that it can help other people as well. All right. All right, everybody's faces are kind of down. It's depressing, right? Like the thought of like pollinators going extinct and you know, I cried myself to sleep on my pillow like at least once a week. So let's look at some bee butts. Bee butts and flowers. I mean, do you feel better? I feel better already. I mean, that just makes me smile. I see smiles. There are smiles on your faces. There were not smiles a second ago. I just proved this scientifically that bee butts make people happy. So if that's not a reason to preserve pollinators, I don't know what is. So while we're here talking about bees, did you know that there are about 3,600 species of bees in North America? Some of them are simply stunning. These are photographs from Sam Drogi at the uh, US, uh, essentially the Forest Service taking photos. These are native bees to the United States from all over. I mean, look at that. It's so fluffy. Like they need to make stuffed toys that look like that. Who wouldn't become an entomologist if you had toys that looked like that? So native bees, like these beauties that we see up here, and not honeybees, do the vast majority of pollinating in our world. Plus, they live solitary lives and rarely sting. I have spent literally hours like this, face to face, looking at pollinators and have never, ever, ever been stopped doing that. They, they don't have a colony to protect. All right, let's go back to our regularly scheduled programming. Enough looking at bee butts. Let's get back to the topic at hand. So the overarching goal of Walmart's pollinator protection policy is to protect, restore, or more sustainably manage 50 million acres of land and 1 million square miles of ocean by 2030. To give you a perspective, 50 million acres is about the size of England, Wales, and Scotland put together, combined and coincidentally is the number of acres lost every single year of rainforest due to human activity. That's massive. So to assist with this really lofty goal that Walmart has by 2030, their new policy requires all global fresh produce and floral suppliers to Walmart to adopt integrated pest management practices as verified by a third party certifier by 2025. That seems, that seems reasonable, right? So by this policy, the organization Friends of the Earth, they have a bee friendly retailer scorecard, which ranks the top US grocery retailers in terms of their uh, protection protection of pollinators. And as a result of this new policy, Walmart jumped from a, what do you think Walmart's score was? An um, a, a to S, based on grading, a grading scale. Okay, everybody who thinks it was an A, raise your hand before this. Yeah, nobody. It was an F. <laughs> totally an S. Yes. They are now first place in terms of their protection of pollinators based on the policy. <laughs> okay, so let's get down into the nitty gritty because we know the devil is in the details, right? And I still don't have all of the details for you, but we can start figuring this out. So suppliers can work with any of a list of third party certifications that have been benchmarked as having meaningful IPM criteria as determined by the IPM Institute of North America. Now I have worked with Tom who started the IPM Institute. This man just received a lifetime achievement award for his contributions to IPM. He truly believes in IPM. If, if he says these are IPM 
verifiable ITM standards, I believe it. So these third-party certifications verify the IPM adoption by Walmart's produce growers, and um, they know that they're protective of pollinator health and determined to include robust IPM criteria. So the programs are the Be Better Certified, you might have seen that label before, the Equitable Food Initiative, Fair Trade International, Global Gap, Integrated Farm Assurance, uh, Leaf Mark, Rainforest Alliance, Sustainable Food Group, Sustainability Standard, Sustainably Grown, the SCS Global, USDA Certified Organic, as well as some international organic labels that meet the USDA standard for equivalency. So I've highlighted in red here the programs that I that have a specific horticultural component. Now, so far what I've been talking about is the produce section at Walmart. So we're talking mostly it's going to be cut flowers, things like that. Now, we don't know if it's going to be small container plants yet that are in there. So you're all probably thinking, yeah, well, I produce liners, no big deal, whatever. But I think there's more to it than that. So Global Gap has a, a, sustainably, a sustainable standard. Uh, I think it's the flowers and the ornamental version, 5.2 or something like that. And then USDA Organic. So those are the ones that are most likely to have an impact. If you can work with these agencies, you have a chance to help determine what the important factors are. So if, if that's within your purview, you have a chance to make these standards better and more suited to the industry. So while you're thinking about all of that, I mean, that's kind of heavy. I, I saw frowns again, frowns. There's a, there's a lot of, oh, regulation. Oh, we don't like, we don't like all that. So let's look at some awesome pollinating flies. So some of these flies, these are all flies. There are, some of them can be amazing bee and, and wasp mimic. There's like 6,000 species of flies. These are cirphid flies, otherwise known as flower flies. Plus, they kind of have a one leg up on the bees. They have marvelous maggots. And these maggots are beneficial insects. You can see the larvae of one of these serpent flies here sucking the juices out of some poor little aphid. Or, what about one of my, probably one of the most adorable insects ever, the bee flies. Look how fluffy they are. Oh my gosh. I like to call these the narwhal of the sky because they have these noses. You can see over there, their noses, their mouth parts, I say noses, their mouth parts don't roll up like, like other bees or flies. Adorable, oh my gosh. There's like 4.5 thousand species of bees. Crazy. In fact, most of the flies that you will encounter on plants, about 80,000 species of 160,000 species of flies are beneficial. Some are predatory, some are parasitic, and even flies like blowflies. Look at the pollen on that sucker. They can be great pollinators. And if none of that moves you, there would be no chocolate without flies, no coffee without flies. Now it's getting personal. <laughs> All right, okay, let's get back to business. Enough, enough gazing at few flies. Let's look at the major components. I'm warning you, this is going to be text heavy, the slide, and I will, I'm gonna read from the slide, which I try never to do, but I couldn't think of any better way to do it. And I'll prom I won't show you more bee buds, but we can go back to that slide if anybody needs it. Just raise your hand and let me know and we'll, we'll look at more bee buds. Okay, so we talked about the first one that all global fresh produce and floral suppliers, again, we're talking about the produce section, they have to adopt the IPN as verified by a third party certifier. Walmart's also going to encourage fresh produce suppliers to protect, restore, or establish habitats on at least 3% 
of the land that they own, operate, and are invested and report annual progress on this. Avoid selling invasive plant species in the retail stores. This is going to be based on regional lists. Again, you have a chance to put your input in now if that's important to you. They're also going to encourage non-organic produce suppliers. Again, this is for ag, but I can easily see this coming over into horticulture. They're going to encourage them to discontinue use of pyrophos and the, the neonicotinoids and other level one B precaution rating pesticides. So if you go online, you can look up level one rating B precaution pesticides, and there's a list. These are the ones that are gonna be the most toxic to, to bees and other pollinators. And they're gonna track the use of it within their supply chain. I don't know how they're gonna do that, but they said they would. They're also going to ask suppliers to label pollinator-friendly plants as attractive to pollinators. What does that mean if something's attractive to pollinators? We know that the vast majority of annuals that are sold at garden centers based on research from University of Michigan do not attract pollinators at all. You know, the, the, the effort to get neonics out of, out of these nurseries when the plants are not even visited by pollinators, it's a good thought, but there's a little bit of a disconnect there. I'm not, I'm not pro or con as far as the neonics go, but let's look at the science and make sure that we, we know what reality is. Again, we might have a chance to give input, what does pollinator friendly mean? They're also going to spe uh, feature special tags to help customers grow their own pollinator gardens, as well as advancing labeling of nursery plants grown without systemic insecticides. I don't know what those labels will look like. Has anybody seen any of these labels at a Walmart yet? Have you seen them? We need to talk because I, I haven't seen them. I'm curious. I'm curious about them. They're also partnering with solar development developers to establish pollinator habitats around solar panel arrays and will work with local organizations to protect, restore, or establish pollinator habitats in major pollinator migration corridors. So the Walmart Foundation has money and they want to create pollinator habitats. So if you have knowledge, if you have an interest in that, that could be a potential funding source or, or place where your plants could end up. So I highlighted in blue the, the, of the six components that I have here, the ones that I think are going to most directly impact the horticulture industry, the plant production industry that we're a part of. Okay, I see frowns. We, we need to see more bugs. That, it always helps me. I, I'm just saying. So we're gonna look at some photos of some beneficial beetles to wash that text heavy slide away out of your memory. So I like to call ladybugs the gateway bug to getting involved with biological control or to get interested in entomology in general. But as you can see from the pollinator covering this cute little, little beetle here, uh, they can also be assist with pollinator. I would not say that they're a primary but they can also do that. Scientists believe that the very first flowering plants co-evolved with beetles as their pollinator partners, not bees. So for some, like 200 million years ago, there's evidence that some magnolias, so magnolias are sort of like the, the progenitor of all modern flowering plants and beetles were the original pollinators. You can see some tumbling flower beetles here. Some magnolias can actually raise the temperature of their blossom up to five degrees Celsius in order to attract beetles. They've been evolving together, doing this evolution dance for 300 million years. They've worked out some systems to make each other happy. Bees didn't even come along until like 30 or 50 million years later for pollination. Now, beetles are often known as mess and soil pollinators because they often will eat the blossoms, poop on the petals, and 
will do other things on the blossom. And it's pretty hard to take pictures of beetles pollinating without other activities going. So, you know, they come in such a gorgeous and stunning array of sizes and colors that, you know, maybe we could forgive some of their less savory habits as they go about the pollinating business looking for the abundant and protein-rich pollen. See, you guys smile every time I put insects up. So obviously insects make people happy. Pollinators make people happy. So I'm sure all of us can imagine that the new Walmart pollinator policy can have far-reaching impacts and implications as other businesses start to fall in line, right? You know, as Walmart leads, people are gonna follow. There's gonna be a ripple effect in the ornamental horticulture industry. So how can we as an industry be proactive and find the benefits of this new pollinator positive direction. So anytime there's a disruption, so in business, I've never taken business classes, but I've observed enough business. When there is disruption, there's the opportunity for innovation and creativity and new businesses to emerge. So, what about if you became somebody that supplied design companies with the floral bricks to build a hidden infrastructure within a city, although otherwise known as pollinator corridors? So this fragmentation of habitats can be an issue. We need to create highways where these pollinators have a chance to breed and have enough floral resources to migrate as well as find mates. What about Become, oh, oh, here's the, uh, the High Line in New York City. They, uh, what a great use of a bridge creating this pollinator corridor. What if you were the supplier for that? That would be an awesome business to get involved in, creating pollinator corridors. How about being the source for pollinator groups? Excuse me. How about becoming the source for pollinator plants for those Walmart farmers that have to put 3% of their acreage into pollinator habitat. You could create seed mixes, you could create liners, uh, clubs for those kind of growers, custom mixes that are based on, on their region or, or pollinators on their farm. Or what about breeding and figuring out how to efficiently grow and market new native ours that have the beauty and the flash that your customers are looking for, but have the, the characteristics, the pollen and the nectar that the, their native pollinators have evolved to require. So those are big long term, those are just ideas. So in the short term, what can you do? As the industry is moving, start getting yourself moving in that direction as well. What if you try replacing one of your products with a bio-rational option? One that may be less sustainable or one that's not as good for pollinators with one that might be more helpful. So, you know, from BioSafe, which is who I work for, or from another company, if you must, but try something different. The, the opportunities and the products that are available now in the bio-rational realm have come so far. For, uh, you know, and the research bears out they can be as effective. We've seen it in the field. They can be as effective when used properly in, understand how to incorporate them into a program. Maybe incorporate some beneficial insects into your program this fall. Um, talk to Suzanne over here. She can help you out with that. So I think it's obvious that I really love bugs. I, I think you guys do too. I saw a lot of smiles. You know, and I'm particularly fond of pollinators and beneficials. So why then do I work for an agrochemical company? I work for a company that makes products that kill insects. Why would I do that? And quite honestly and sincerely, it's because of the foundation of sustainability and, and the efficacy that underlies all of BioSafe's products that I've, I've come to know. If I can help educate a grower to replace a a product that harms pollinators with an equally effective by a rational choice using a new paradigm of thinking, I feel like I've contributed to pollinator health. 
My job is my vocation. This is what I believe in. And I've really been excited over the past few years to see the increase in companies that are introducing sustainable products to the market. You know, you know that there's something going on when BASF starts selling it into my pathogens. They see them writing on the wall. Walmart Mark knows things. These big companies are there to make money, right? They might be virtue signaling, I don't know. But we've seen it work in the field. We've seen it be effective. I've also been excited to see how bio our biological control companies have come along. So as the sector of the market matures, we can learn from each other. You know, we might be competitors, but the more experience that we have in the field with these products, the better we'll learn how to use them and effectively employ them into successful programs. We know it can be done. We see it happen every day. So we, we're going to create a new and industry-wide pest management paradigm, one connection, and one research project and one sale at a time. And as much as I love technology and the potential that it can have to improve our industry and our lives, robo hives are not what I want to see when I, I want, you know, I don't want them to replace our diverse and endlessly interesting 200,000 plus pollinator species that pollinate 308,000 species of plants. My life would be a lot less boring. You guys would not smile nearly as much. So today, I have passed along my knowledge to you as so many grains of pollen. So I am going to encourage you to go out, do your own pollinating, so that we can create a more fruitful and sustainable industry and world and I want to thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you today and, and for your time and attention. And does anybody need to go back and look at butts? We can do that for hours. <laughs> Are there any questions? All right. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.